The only people who don't want to disclose the truth are people with something to hide. Everyone, three minutes after the hour, 503 Tuesday morning, the 15th of July. Um, I have in this last six to eight years pursued a story that really is almost like that child's book called The Unending Story. There is no end uh, to the questions. There's no end to the idiocy of the media, and there certainly is no end to questioning the life of Barack Obama. This is really one tough woman. Please say good morning and welcome back to 710 KNUS. I'm proud to call her a friend. Susan Daniels joins us. Hey, Susan, thanks. Good morning and welcome back to the show. Hi, Peter. Good morning to you and thanks for having me back. No, I'm telling you what. Um, I Before we begin into your new breakthroughs, do you get the sense that perhaps we are getting closer to the bone as Barack Obama's um, approval rating is now in the low 40s and dropping uh, with more and more people, although I don't expect it to be you know, what we call big media, but more and more people that I deal with on uh, daily levels here as guests all say, you know, I have no idea who he is. I'm, I'm talking about former Congress people. I'm talking about all kinds of folks media critics, um, you know, critics of, of, of society in general. And these are people that I, I swear to you five years ago may have not even known that there were issues surrounding or swirling around the truth of Barack Obama. So before we begin with your hard work, do you get a sense that there is blood in the water now? Oh, I think the most obvious thing was when he went to West Point. He... They they like didn't even acknowledge him when he spoke. Yeah. You know, um, I was always worried about the military because, you know, being commander in chief. But what I see you know, I I'm a lot less worried about the military now because I can see they have no respect for him. Well he went to the West Point commencement exercise and spoke about global warming. Right. I mean, that well, was, what's he, what's he going to talk about? What a great job he's done as president? I don't know. I mean, generally, if you look at presidential speeches at military academy graduations, not to diminish anything, but they're generally raw, raw speeches. Oh, yeah. I My older brother graduated from West Point. That's yeah. exactly what they are. Sure. Um, you know, they tell them what's the great line from Douglas MacArthur is duty on her country. Right. And this guy spoke about the fight against global warming. Well, he's a fool, so what will we expect? Well, but, you know, he was here in town, I'll tell you an interesting story. He spoke at a park, you know, a public park, Cheeseman Park here in Denver. Right. And they built a fence around the park so people couldn't come in. I thought that was fascinating. He won't build a fence on the border to keep, no. out, to keep out the illegals, but they will fence in Cheeseman Park to keep out citizens of the, of the city of Denver. Um a select media group was allowed in, and then later that night they had a fundraiser in a big hotel room, which even one of his principal funders, uh, Mark Udall, Senator Udall, didn't, he didn't attend either one because he, I, I'm sure he took the money, but he just didn't want his picture taken. Right. So the, the work that you have done, and please, I should have opened the show with this, um, how and why you got into this, and a little bit of your background, because you are one of the unique people in this um, cabal, if you would, a witch's brew of people who chase down who is Barack Obama. So, Susan, if you would take a second with the audience and tell us. Well, I've been a, a, a licensed investigator in Ohio for 20 years now, and I just had a bad feeling about him from the start. And I, I think it... You know, I was, like everybody else, willing to give this guy a chance, although I was very concerned about his lack of credentials. And um, when I saw how he started pushing this need to spend money, just like he's doing now with the $3.7 billion he wants to, to use for illegal immigrants, when I saw, you know, the stimulus and I saw where the money was going, I, it, nothing clicked. I, you know, I, a client of mine said, you know, can you look into his background? I never expected to find anything. And 
So the minute I started looking, very quickly I found his social security number, which which amazed me, and I immediately recognized it as phony. And I, I tried to tell a couple of people, and I said, you know, you're nuts. Well, I knew the way that social security numbers had been issued across the United States. Now, they changed that in June uh, 2011 because they did, it's an effort to muddy the water sure. and, and do more with immigrants. Sure, it's but convenient. But I knew it was right. phony. Yeah. And I spent, I spent months just running background stuff, reading, reading everything I could get my hands on, and I knew I was right. And then I started, you know, I started contacting the Social Security Administration. They wouldn't give me any information about the number he uses, which actually had been assigned to somebody that was born in 1890. And it kept coming up on his own documents, like a, a cell phone bill that I uh, found for him. And, you know, it would have his, his 1961 date of birth, mm-hmm. but it also had 1890. Yeah. And then when I ran, I tried to verify the number. It also came up with his name in the year 1890. Well, you know, he yeah. that number was assigned you're, when he right. was you're, 15 years old. You're good, but you're not that good, right? Remember that? You're, <laughs> you're, you're good, but you're not that good. Right. And let, let's, let's retrench, because this is important. Until June of 2011, SSNs were issued to the address where a person lived where he exactly. or she Your applied. Exactly, right. when you applied. And, yeah. and, it, to this, and every state broke down. Mm-hmm. They had a certain set of the first three mm-hmm. numbers belonged exclusively to the residents of that area. Yeah. We go slow state. because I, at one time, when it was so heated and weird, I was getting so much grief. Um, I got that chart that if you told me your first three numbers, I could tell you where you were born. And well, it's not even so much as where you were born as where you applied. I, I should have said that. I apologize. Yeah. yeah. And so, people tend to confuse yeah. that, so too. I'm Western Pennsylvania. I'm 185. Yeah. And there was a challenger on the air, actually, very recently. And I said, no. I said, and I always worked for cash, but I got a job in a, in a bowling alley when I was 14 years old. Right. And, and they had paychecks. I mean, you know, like working in a pool room, having right. a paper route. They paid you in cash. Mm-hmm. But when I worked in a bowling alley, they actually had paychecks. So my mom took me downtown Pittsburgh, and I had to go in this place and get a Social Security number, a, a card. Mm-hmm. And mine's 185. And Hawaii is either 575 or 576, right? Right. That's the first three digits. And if Barack Obama's story where he worked at Baskin Robbins at 16 years of age, and this was his first, quote, real job, and I'm sure a corporation like Baskin Robbins, just like the pool room, excuse me, like the bowling alley, they gave paychecks. Right. But, but keep in mind, he didn't start using the Connecticut number that's until the port- he was 25 well, that, years that's old. That's right. Now, let me, let me back this out because I got these two suppositions. This one, okay. One is... In my reading and my trying to understand, Social Security has set aside numbers for foreign nationals. Right. And if you proclaim yourself to be a foreign national or prove right. you're a foreign national, you get a whole other three letters, three three yes. letters, pardon me, three numbers. Right. What are the odds, Susan, that he did have an SSN that his grandma toot or, or gramps or toot got for him and it was for an Indonesian or a Kenyan or whatever proclamations they had been making about him when he was going to Punahou School and doing the rest of that dance, that he actually had an SSN that was assigned to a foreign-born national or words to that effect. Well, I think his mother probably got it for him when he was in Indonesia. Could she have done that in Jakarta? She was working for the State Department. Right. So that's 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 one possibility. Right. And she was there for five years. Oh, yeah, I know. Or two, he, Gramps and Toot got him one in Hawaii when he got back to, when she, whatever, whatever her reasons, and we don't know, send him back to Hawaii to go and live with Toot and Gramps and be close to Frank Marshall Davis. So at that point, maybe he got a Social Security number that was assigned to a foreign national. Right. So he gets to, how old is he when he transfers over to this 
bizarre Connecticut number? Uh, he was 25 already. Was he back in Chicago by, or into Chicago? Oh, he, had, he had allegedly finished Occidental and gone through Conne- uh, Columbia. Columbia. Mm-hmm. So he didn't start using that number until after then. That's what I thought. Now, remember, there's also this bizarre moment that doesn't come out until much later in the speech in San Francisco when he actually talks about going back, going to Pakistan. Right. But first he tells people, that he went back to Indonesia to see his mother. But right. we, but the timeline, um, Ann Dunham or Ann Dunham Obama Saturo or Ann, whatever her name is at the time, right? she's back in Hawaii. She is, um, she's not in Jakarta anymore. So why does he go to Jakarta is the question. Again, I don't have answers. But does he go there to renew his Indonesian passport as a foreign national, so he can go to Pakistan with his two friends. And again, because it wasn't that Americans were not allowed to go to Pakistan, but they were told not to go. Right. So does he go? Because he told everybody, he, oh, he went back to visit Stanley Ann. Stanley Ann wasn't there. Right. So again, these are these huge holes, and they're always covered up by big media and covered up by the apologists and the people who are already sending us 15 emails already this morning. I see you have another racist B. That's what they call you. There's the B word on your show this morning. Take a bow. Take a bow. Racist B. Well, the the people calling me a racist might be surprised to know that I have, uh, there are members of my family who are biracial. It doesn't matter. It doesn't doesn't what this is about. I mean, you know, call me with, you you know, know. I, I don't know about you, Peter, but. I have certainly been called a whole lot worse than racist. Yeah, I mean, I, and they, that card has been so overplayed. I know that it's meaningless to me. No, of course, I mean, it is. It's like somebody called me a cracker. Well, what do I care? It's what a I, word. I, I, not it doesn't that, mean anything to yeah, me. If unless it, unless if the shoe fits, wear it. If not, exactly. So anyhow, exactly. so like I said, I want you to know that you've got your and they're never signed. I I love these. Oh, I, of course not. Cowards never sign anything. I was asked, how is it cold in your mom's basement? <laughs> I don't. <laughs> no, it's when I. But or, or also, like I said, these are people who would never walk up in the street and say it to your face. So of course so, not. I mean, they don't well, have the courage. But I just wanted you to know they're already here. So oh well, good. Yeah. So, I have, so they're I, listening, it's right? It's a negative fan club, but it's a fan club That's nonetheless. Right. So the first three digits for Hawaii are seven five right. seven seven five six. Obama's sister is seven five six. Yeah, and, but she was born in Indonesia. Right. And, but her number is. Seven five six. She got it, I think, six years after he started using yeah. the Connecticut one. All right. So <laughs> it, why? Yeah. So Connecticut. And so Obama uses o four two. I almost know it like my own o four two six eight four four two five. Right. And he started using that in nineteen eighty six. Right. And where did that number come from? Well, you know, it was it belonged to somebody else originally from Connecticut, and uh, the Social Security uh, uh, Administration never reuses numbers. No, never. they can't. They can't. No, no, they absolutely can't. Now, it, it, the number is a stolen number. Yeah, so it's a well. So is his draft number, his registration number. Right. So enter the dragon, Bill. Well, o- and the thing is, see, he. He, I heard him say one or time or I read an interview where he said he immediately signed up for selective service as soon as he graduated in 79. No, he didn't. Well, the documents that they prepared in 2007 for him mm-hmm. say that he signed up in 1980. Mm-hmm. Well, now, I, but let me again, here's my supposition. Yeah. Proclaiming himself as a foreign national, he didn't have to register for the draft. No, he did not have to register. However... If he if he's an American citizen nah. and did not register, ah. he's going to jail. Well, of course, but number two, he has no idea that he's going to get himself uh, in, embroiled in Chicago politics, run for office, nope. and do those things. I mean, um, so all of a sudden, somebody taps him on the shoulder, maybe his best friend Bill Ayers, right. and says, who, you know, I, who is an identification thief himself. Yeah, who I suspect provided the number. Yeah. But but the the huge mistake they made now uh, was the, the selective service because allegedly uh, he signed up in 1980 
and they have the Connecticut mm-hmm. Social Security number on there. So you know he was older than that. Right. Before no. he ever used I mean, it. there's no question. This is all fabrications and lies, but it's something right. like this. And I am no fan of George Bush, but if this was George Bush, um, Brian Williams in Evening News would be leading with this. But, yeah. but, and, and I, too, am no fan of George Bush. But if, if the circumstances were changed, I mean, he would have been forced out of office. Oh, trust me. So here we go. So and then comes one of the great laydowns of all time. And I really dislike this man as a human being. I know too much about his private life. Bill O'Reilly. Oh, uh, he's just, he is, he's just a media whore. He, I mean, I've been called that. Actually, I, I formed something with this really brilliant guy um, named Don Reggae. We formed Media Horror Productions. Uh, during the Ram- By the way, we're going to return to the Ramsey case this morning. There's one for everybody. But uh, when they were during the Ramsey case, we formed Media Horror Productions. Right. And we still own that. So, but, but Bill, you know, Bill O'Reilly is, and like, I don't care about what he does on 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 the tube. He's just not a good guy. He's not. No, he's, he's not. not. A, he's not a good. He's, he's not. not. He's not. A, he's, in fact, he's a bad guy. Yep. Talk about O'Re- talk, talk about O'Reilly and all of this. Well, he's, you know, the thing that, I never watch him because I think he's just a jerk. You know, he's a tall jerk, but he's a jerk nonetheless. And his arrogance comes through. And if there's anything I can't stand, it's arrogance. Well, I was flipping channels one night. And, you know, in the, the one segment of his show, people send in questions that he answers. And somebody said, well... What about Obama and this Connecticut Social Security number? And Riley, with you know, pulling up all his his smugness, yeah. says, "Well, you know, his father lived in Connecticut for a couple of years." It's a lie, and, and which is an outright lie because obviously he doesn't know Harvard is not in Connecticut. See, it's, a, it's a lie. That's right. And he said, uh, "And you know, sometimes parents get them for their for their babies." It's a lie. Or something. It was a total lie. Total lie. I, I went right through the roof. Because, you know, it, it, the irony was that I was just flipping channels and caught it at right the exact time. And uh, the next day, that segment was scrubbed yep. from his podcast. They, that's right. They, and let, he let, was off the show for a couple of days. Susan, let me do this. Because, because he ends up getting that live Super Bowl ha- um, halftime uh, that interview, and I guarantee you, I would be willing to bet the house that Barack Obama knew every question in advance before he sat down with oh, O'Reilly. Oh, without a doubt. Are you sit here. Can I, may I take a pause and bring you back? Sure, uh, This please. is one of the true best, you guys. Susan Daniels with us. One of my true favorites. Susan Daniels is here. Uh, she, of course, is the principal prime mover in one of the areas of who is Barack Obama, and that is the two numbers that he uses his SSN and his uh, his draft registration number, and we were talking about Bill O'Reilly, Mr. Bill. Or <laughs> now, Mr. Bill, as you pointed out, first of all, if you remember back when all this began, I was working at Brand X then, and Mr. Bill came on his television show and said he had personally seen the truth. Do you remember that? Right. And then when Which was per- a lie, was a lie. Then he got pressed, and he said, "Well." His staff had seen the truth. Yeah. And then pressed, they said, well, they saw the newspaper ads. <laughs> and, of course, the newspaper ads are a con, too. Right. So then Mr. O now said that his, that the other Barack, as he's known as, went to Connecticut, where he went to school and got the number, which is not true either. No. And, in fact, I'd be willing to bet my house again that the other Barack never laid eyes on the president until he was probably, I don't know what, 12 years of age, when the other Barack returned to Hawaii for all kinds of different reasons. But again, Barack said he didn't even, he met the guy, and he doesn't look like the guy. He looks like Frank Marshall Davis, but yeah. But he, so I, I, don't, I would be willing to bet, like I said, she's taken off and gone to Washington State before that baby's seven or eight days a, of, I'll give it even 10 days of age. So, like I said, I'd be willing to bet the house that the other Barack never even saw the other Barack. How's that? Well, the thing that's interesting in Hawaii, 
the first birthday of the baby is a huge celebration, huge party. And that's it's always been that way. And the reason is because years ago, so few babies lived to yeah. see their first birthday. So a long time ago, they treat a first birthday almost like a wedding. It's a huge thing. Mm-hmm. And he left Hawaii two months before Barack was one year old. Well, better yet, she's gone. I mean, she's gone to Washington State when he's probably 10 days of age. Uh, yeah, yeah. And so wh- whether when he goes to off to Harvard or doesn't go off to Harvard, it doesn't matter because she's not there. He would he couldn't see the baby if he wanted to. Right. And well, he, he I don't what he, he had no interest. Of course not. <laughs> he, he if it, if it was anything it was a one night stand or right. as other people say, he offered cover for um for well, all kinds of According to the father's immigration records, he was he was forced out of Harvard. Yeah. He, was, he went there to do his dissertation and ended up getting a 17-year-old girl pregnant, a foreign student, right. who went off to London for an abortion yes. and then couldn't get back into our country. And the and immigration says, we don't want this guy. I mean, he, he was... He's a bad guy. He, he was a bad guy. And, you know, we said how his life ended. Yeah, he's well. an alcoholic, and he hit a tree when he was drunk. and Well, he but he had... He had three tra- car accidents oh, when no. he was drunk. Yeah. The second time, he lost both his legs, yes. and the third time, he killed him. That's right. So he was a terrible, tragic, alcoholic, abused women. Yes. And um, like I said, he, he died behind the wheel drunk. But you're right. He had had, had his legs amputated from a drinking accident prior to that. So right. this is not a good man. No, no. So and- wh- I'm and sorry. Obama's mother was not a good mother. No, no. She ships her kid anywhere she wants. Well, you know, you abandon your own child, yeah. but, but you then keep your daughter. Yeah. It's like, hmm, no wonder he's not crazy about white people. Well, <laughs> that's right. That's a great line. Let me ask you this. How does, sure. o, how does Why do you think O'Reilly fits into all of this? Well, because he's making a lot of money. All right. You know, he, uh, you know, sadly, and he's no different than um, Rush or Glenn Beck or Hannity or any mm-hmm. of them. You notice none of them have ever addressed the eligibility. Oh, I got into a big hoot with uh, Glenn Beck. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was... They skate around everything. I mean, they're, mm. they're so moral in, in, in their daily presentations, and yet they avoid the obvious. Uh, they they like mean, their paycheck. No, I mean, Beck, Beck and I, seriously, I mean... And then he went on his show, um, this is when I was actually working the same station, working for the same company. And um, I, I've been told by some other people that Beck is revisiting this. I, I don't know. I doubt it. You know what, uh, uh, Peter, I sent him and Rush immediately after I found the information. Uh, they were the first people I sent the information to. I have, through the years, probably sent documentation to at least two dozen uh, politicians. And the last go-round, in in desperation, I sent a copy of the entire 104-page lawsuit to the homes of, you know, Ted Cruz, Mm -hmm. Jason Chaffetz, Ryan uh, Priebus, Trey Gowdy, and what I even did is, is so that they wouldn't get alarmed that there's large manila envelope coming. I called all their offices, told them who I am, why I was sending them to their homes, because I didn't want it to get mixed in with all the other stuff sent to the you know to Washington, and never heard a sound from between 25 and 30 people. Not not a word. I tell you something, an interesting story. I when this is said and done, and if it's just you and I, I tell you, there was a, a congressperson that I uh, had a conversation with who said to me, "Oh, we all know a story's not true. Uh, a story's not straight." And I said, "Well, why don't you do something about it?" Oh well. There was your answer. Oh well. Uh, well, well and, you know, we uh, I went through a long time with the Denver Post and the Rocky Mountain News. The Rocky Mountain News is out of business. They wrote columns about what things I was saying and cartooned me. 
And I would polite, yeah. I would politely ask them to come on the radio show, and either they would not respond, or they would. They had a great line: "I will not appear on your hate show," <laughs> which was just a way that they didn't have to answer questions. Right. And so, but I, I think even now, I think now here we are, 2014, in the middle of July. I, I think that if, unless you are less than room temperature IQ, you know that this guy's story is not straight. Oh, of course not. But, you know, what I, what I figure is um, that the people that still support him, despite the fact of the destruction he has caused throughout this country, these are the people, these are the liberals, the, the, the highly educated ones, who refuse to admit that they got conned. That, you know, that, I'll tell you what, I come to that belief as well. I believe that, for instance, the, uh, the fathers and mothers at the Denver Post would have to be able to say, or Brian Williams or Channel 9 or whomever, would actually have to say, you know, we did not do our job. We never vetted this guy. I mean, this is a guy that was nominated here in Denver. Yep. And, and I tell you, I was there. I mean, it was like, the, it was, I tell you, it was the second coming. And, um, I mean, the, the, um, these people were just over the top. And, and that's the first time I had heard people say, the story ain't straight. No. And what's that been, he, seven he years? Yeah. He, he done, had none. Has no bona fides. No. It's, you know, it just, I, I just bang my head against the wall when I say, how could somebody like him with the, uh, his past associations, his lack of any kind of ability, his known laziness, and he, he readily admits he's mm-hmm. lazy. Uh, how do you... How do you elect this guy to the most important position in the United States? Oh, it's a great story. Oh, uh, it's 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 the greatest con that has it, ever been told. It, you know, I say this: the Clintons ran a grift. They were grifters. Oh yeah. This guy's running what's called the long con. Oh yeah. And he's got to be. You know, we have this fellow coming on the radio show. He's a psychotherapist, and he's written a book, and he says. And he's also, you know, one of us. He's a guy who says, look, the story isn't straight. But how can he not think that any morning he's going to wake up and that somebody, someone like you or somebody like a Corsi or Cashio or somebody arms Trump with something like Trump offered that $50 million, just let me see your grades. You know, you would think something like that would be a, at least Brian Williams might take a make, might take a look at that. Wouldn't you think? Yeah, because he was offering it to, for him to give to any charity, any charity he wanted. wanted. Yeah. yeah, any place in Chicago or wherever he wanted Anywhere. to do with the money, right? So, again, where are we, and what do you think well, happens uh, what next? What I'm worried about is look at the damage he's done since 2009. He's got two more years to go. He's mm-hmm. going to ramp it up. Let me do this. I'm close to a pause again. When we come back, uh, again, if you're just joining us, I just think she hung the moon. Uh, Susan Daniels <laughs> is our guest. No, she is. And, and, and she... Bless um, her heart. No, no, it's true. And, you know, I read your piece that begins, began with... And, I, I know, I'm lockstep with you. you. You said, and I said, it's like me thinking, you writing it. I used to believe we had a two-party political system. I was disillusional. I, I, I got a good smack of reality on September the 4th, 2012, when I stood in front of the Republican judge in a rural county of, of Ohio. We'll pick the story up there. One of my true favorites is on the line with us, Susan Daniels, and she has done all the heavy lifting on two numbers pertaining to Barack Obama. One is his SSN, and the other one, of course, his draft registration. And so... Like me, you said, look, the good smack of reality. What happened in the smack of reality? Well, I had sued the Secretary of State in an effort to keep Barack Obama off the ballot here in Ohio in 2012. And uh, I put together a very compelling case. Um, I, it was the, the lawsuit itself was 18 pages long, but I added another 83 pages of documents supporting everything I said. Well, I get to to this hearing, 
and nobody else is there. Nobody's there from the Secretary of State's office. Um, the judge asks his bailiff, you know, have they called, have they anything? And his, his rules of court are very strict. You will be there. You will be ready to go, yada, yada. Well, there's nobody there. And she says, no, nobody's here and nobody's called. And, and he said, well, you know, do you want to postpone this or do you want to go ahead? And I thought, no, we're just going to go ahead. And to my astonishment, he then somehow slipped into the role of the defense attorney, which I, I stood there just stunned. You know, because I filed this pro se, I didn't have an attorney or anybody with me. And um, I told him that I had other documents that I wanted to enter as exhibits that I had not included with the original filing. And uh, one of the things was a, uh, an affidavit from Jack Cashill, who I've known sure. for several years, sure. and I, I think the world of. Um, in it, he wrote that in the four years that he uh, investigated Obama before he wrote uh, Deconstructing Obama, at no point is there ever a mention anywhere that, that Obama had ever been to Connecticut, mm -hmm. even for a visit. And he said, um, uh, you know, there's just no one, no one has ever mentioned it. Anyhow, uh, I tell the judge what I have is, and that I want to enter that as, as an exhibit. And the judge says, well, is it evidence? And I stand there and I'm, you know. Because of how political correctness works and how newspeak works, is birther is in the equivalent of racist and it right. was, and and early on when we all began to look at this man's story being dubbed a birther and the denver post did it and the rocky mountain news did it and their columnist did it and their cartoonist did it that they equated birther to racist which we're seeing this again with eric holder now who said anybody who criticizes the president <laughs> you know that kind of a thing yeah and it, and it believe me when i tell you it works it works the, the last thing in the media, the last thing any of these people, whether it's a local news anchor, um, a reporter, a columnist, a uh, fill in the blankest, the, the number one thing they can't be called or even yelled at because they can't take it, they fold like tents, is, right. is racist. And, and that's why when this whole thing began with the illegal immigration, anyone who spoke against it, I did, you were a racist. It, and, and so this was the great fear that somebody at the Denver Post or at Channel 9 or at yeah, Brian he, Williams, or they would get called a name. I mean... Oh, wow. Well, no, I, I'm, I'm not making that up. I mean... Oh, I'm, no, I know. I, I'm, I'm, and, 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 uh, it disgusts me because I know you're, you're yeah. absolutely right. And, and when it comes to, um, you know, the, the so-called big-time talk show host, Limbaugh will bounce in and out of it at, with the wise guy remark from time to time, I'm told... Uh, somebody will send me a cut where he makes a, a snide remark. O'Reilly, let it go. I mean, O'Reilly is nothing more than a pretty creepy opportunist. Right. Sean Hannity, um, I can't speak to. Uh, I've had, like I said, I, I went through that whole thing with Beck. And even showing, um, Beck sat in the studio with me. And um, I was showing him overwhelming evidence. and And then he... That and then the next time we we were together, he was by phone, and it just got really off the hook. And then he went on his regular show, and attacked it. And so, um, I don't know. I mean, like I said, maybe someday there will be an accounting, as they say. Oh, there will, and yeah. and it's going to turn out that all these people, you know, kept their paycheck, sure. and threw their country sure. away. Yeah. I am on the wall. Um, I think the world of you as always. We'll, we'll, I've been hoping well, someday you. for a conference, but uh, that doesn't look like anybody. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a that's a lot of money to do this, and so all we can do is just keep slugging one foot ahead of the other. But I know someday, sometime, someplace, Susan, you'll be a hero um, when people really well, find out what happened. I think you give me too much credit. Uh, I just I just want people to stop saying I'm lying because I'm no, not. You're not. Or people with Thanks, pal. Mind.